So uh, let me, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Sergio Kleinerman today, a professor of mathematics at Princeton University and uh, one of the foremost experts in the mathematical study of uh, general relativity. So he's a frequent visitor to the IHES and uh, he's uh, on our board of uh, Friends of IHES. Uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, Friends of IHES is the uh, American uh, support and uh, public charity that uh, supports the uh, Institute's vision and philosophy in the United States uh, for more than 20 years. So uh, this should be a very uh, interesting talk because it's often uh, astrophysicists and physicists who talk about black holes. And there's many, many interesting questions from many points of view. And the point of view of uh, mathematicians such as Sergio is uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, different. So without further ado, let's uh, begin, Sergio. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very glad uh, to be able to give this talk. Uh, uh, I First of all, I wonder if everything is okay. Can you see the screen? Uh, we, we see it well. It, it, uh, yes. You see it well. Very good. Okay. So, um, uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I apologize. This is not going to be a talk uh, for... Uh, specialists. Uh, I'll try to uh, be quite introductory for the vast majority of people who uh, are attending today. Uh, the question that I'm, I'm going to, to try to uh, answer is a, a question of uh, uh, what is a relationship somehow between the physical reality of black holes and the mathematics of it. So uh, with this, let me start. Uh, first, let me talk a little bit about the basic geometric tools or the basic geometric objects uh, that are used in general relativity. So of course, they are exactly the same as the one in geometry. So, uh, uh, you know, for to start with, uh, we talk about manifolds. Uh, so manifolds really think of manifolds as collections of of uh, open sets and coordinates on them and the way of transi transitioning from one coordinate to another. Um, and uh, the concept which uh, is a great concept uh, in mathematics, which was introduced by many people starting with Riemann, in fact. The metric, uh, which you see here, uh, <coughs> which is this kind of expression, is expressed relative to a system of coordinates. So it's again, it's a local definition of a metric. It's a tool of measuring distances on the manifold. So there is a very simple. Once I have this kind of this this kind of tool, I I can easily define a distance between points and so on and so forth. We'll see that uh, there is a difference between Riemannian metrics and Lorentzian metrics. I'll I'll say a few words uh, in a second. Once I have the metric, I can talk about uh, uh, the connection, the uh, so-called Levi-Civita connection, uh, which is really just uh, an expression involving derivatives of the metric G relative to the coordinates. So again, relative to a system of coordinates, that's what it is. By the way, uh, th this kind of formulation here allows it's a it's a very simple way which allows you to pass from one coordinate to another. In other words, these coefficients that I see here. Uh, they correspond to a particular coordinate system. If I want to change coordinates, I change it very easily according to this kind of expression. I don't want to get into details, of course, but uh, but just remember that uh, the metric really is given here relative to a system of coordinates, but of course I can always change coordinates into something else. The connection uh, is uh, represents derivative, again, in the system of coordinates, derivative of the metric relative to the coordinates. Uh, this, by the way, is not uh, does not is not a tensorial quantity. It doesn't change well relative to system of coordinates. However, uh, you can use it to define uh, what is called the curvature of the manifold. So this is a concept introduced first by Gauss in dimension two. The manifold here was a dimension two manifold, a sphere, or a surface. I'm sorry, and uh, uh, it's really uh, a derivative at the level of derivatives of the gamma. So there is some kind of algebraic relation between 
between the curvature and derivative of the gamma. The, the remarkable thing about the Riemann curvature tensor is that uh, it's invariant. It doesn't depend on the particular coordinate system. So even though this was depending on the coordinate system, this doesn't. Once I have the, the Riemann curvature tensor, I can take traces. So again, everything is done relative to coordinates, but again, uh, in reality, uh, these expressions do not depend on coordinates. So of course, it, it takes some time to see it, but believe me, it's true. So, uh, so here I'm taking a trace, uh, what is called a trace. You see, there are four indices in the, this Riemann curvature tensor. I can take a trace and I get what is called the Ricci curvature, uh, which is now a two tensor. And because of the symmetry, so th this Riemann curvature tensor has lots of symmetries. Uh, and uh, because of them, in, in reality, this tensor here is a symmetric two tensor. Uh, I'm, by the way, using uh, the so-called summation convention, which in fact was introduced by Einstein, from what I understand, uh, which is summation of a repeated indices, right? So whenever you see beta and beta here, it means you are actually summing and the same thing with the other index. All right, so these are, uh, these are the basic objects. And of course, uh, uh, the simplest uh, manifolds and the simplest geometric structure are the one uh, that of Euclidean geometry, where you just have Rn and the distances are measured using the Pythagoras theorem. And um, uh, the generalization of it is called Riemannian geometry. So generalization simply means that uh, the metric is much more complicated and is defined on a manifold. Uh, and, uh, and then there is a Minkowski space. Uh, so this is a, a, a concept which was introduced in the wake of special relativity after Einstein. Uh, Minkowski is the one who saw the geometric structure of special relativity. Uh, these are called, as a consequence, Minkowski and metric. And the generalization of this Minkowski and geometry is called Lorentzian geometry in the honor of uh, the physicist Lorentz. All right, so uh, let's connect now all these things with physics. So this is a, a remarkable thing about general relativity is that there is a very, very clear connection between objects which are mathematics and, and objects which are uh, physical. In fact, uh, uh, mathematical objects are interpreted uh, in physical language. So for example, the so-called inertia, the fact that uh, that uh, uh, you can uh, annulate your, you, you can cancel your gravity, you cancel the, the force of gravity on yourself locally, it's expressed by the fact that uh, the tangent space to the manifold, in other words, that the tangent space, think of it as something really very intuitive, as in uh, normal uh, Euclidean geometry, uh, the tangent to a surface. Here is a tangent to a manifold. You can define this concept even if the manifold is abstract. Uh, so on the tangent space, you have a Minkowskian structure. In other words, the metric uh, at the given point can be expressed as the simplest possible uh, Lorentzian type of uh, metric, which is a Minkowski metric. Uh, so you see the Minkowski, uh, geometrically, you see how the Minkowski metric looks like in the tangent space. You have a light con, uh, you have uh, uh, what would be the time and, and spatial coordinates. Uh, and the, the metric is such that it vanishes on, the, on this light con. It's, uh, it's uh, negative inside here and it's positive uh, outside. In fact, in Lorentzian geometry, if you go back to the definition here, uh, if the coordinates are, say, t from time, and then x1, x2, xn, then this metric here, the Lorentzian metric, is nothing else but the one in which you have uh, minus 1, 1, 1, 1 on the diagonal, and 0 everywhere else, right? So it's a very, very simple. It's a simplest, uh, the simplest uh, possible metric. Of course, Euclidean, in the Euclidean, the Euclidean metric, you have one everywhere on the diagonal and zero everywhere else uh, for the Euclidean metric. And here it starts with minus one and then one, one, one. So it has signature minus one, 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 which is typical to uh, Lorentzian geometry. Uh, okay, so the inertia, uh, which is a physical concept, can be expressed uh, purely by saying that the, the uh, metric uh, that what you are me measuring is, is this kind of Lorentzian metric, which, find it, which becomes trivial at the point. Events represent um, 
points in M. So any point on the manifold is in fact an event. Observers correspond to time-like curves. So in other words, curves that really move in such a way that the tangent space at every point on the curve is time-like. Time-like meaning if you look at the light cone passing through the corresponding point, uh, the tangent is in the direction of the light cone. So inside the light cone, in other words. It's null if it's, if it's uh, along the null cone. And uh, th this corresponds exactly to light rays. So light rays, again, which are physical concept, are nothing else in, uh, in Lorentzian geometry, nothing else than null geodesics, in other words, geodesics, which have this kind of uh, uh, forms, right? So which, uh, uh, in Minkowski space are just straight, straight lines at 45 degrees. The equivalence principle, uh, which is a fundamental concept which was used by Einstein to, to uh, write down general relativity, is nothing else but the general covariance uh, in mathematical, mathematical uh, expression, which simply means that all the objects which are used to define the, your equations, uh, the physical objects, in other words, uh, are invariant relative to system to any system of coordinates. So you can change coordinates every one you please. Here is a, a simplest mathematical way of saying that for any diffeomorphism, any map from the manifold to itself, you can uh, take the pullback of the metric uh, by phi and uh, you get uh, a new metric here. And somehow uh, the physical, uh, all the physical equations should, should be independent on this kind of uh, transformations. Okay, so this, this is general covariance and it, it's really equivalent uh, at the physical level with the equivalence principle. Tidal forces, uh, which are physical, correspond to curvature, nothing else but curvature. Uh, isolated systems, uh, which are systems in which something happens and outside, outside the particular region, uh, there are no other, uh, no other uh, I mean, things become Minkowskian in a sense. Uh, so in other words, the manifold, the manifold that uh, we are interested in, uh, it's called asymptotically flat, meaning uh, it's, uh, it may be complicated in some region of space, but as you go to infinity, you, you are talking about uh, open manifolds. As you go to infinity, things become Minkowskian. Okay, so again, Everything you want can be expressed in geometrical language. Every physical concept can be expressed in, in, uh, in uh, mathematical language. The equations themselves, which are the famous field equations of Einstein, uh, are of this type. You have on the left-hand side, you have something purely geometric. This is a Ricci curvature, which we have just discussed, uh, minus a half. This is uh, the scalar curvature, which is obtained by just taking another trace taking G alpha beta alpha beta up of R alpha beta. This gives you R. So you, you, this difference is equal on the right-hand side with a T which corresponds to the energy momentum tensor of matter fields in the space-time. So in other words, it's not just this uh, MNG, which is used, uh, which is all we study in physics. You also have uh, fields, additional matter fields that uh, one can put here. And uh, somehow it, it, each of these additional fields have uh, an energy momentum tensor. Uh, and uh, this is what comes up in the right-hand side. Okay, so, so this is expressed purely in terms of the fields that are present on, your, on our space. The simplest case is exactly the one in which there are no, uh, no uh, additional fields, no additional matter fields, in which case T is zero. Uh, and uh, you can get actually read it, in, 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 so you'll have zero here. And from there, it's easy to see that actually the Ricci curvature has to be identical equal to zero. So from a physical point of view, this is called the Einstein vacuum equations because there is nothing present on our space time. And uh, uh, it corresponds to pure propagation of gravitational waves. So it's not that the space time becomes trivial, it's, it's high non-trivial. Uh, but uh, even in, in the case when you don't have matter fields, uh, in, in, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, corresponds from a physical point of view to gravitational waves. Okay, so that's, as I said, the general covariance uh, 
the fact that uh, this every quantity that appears in the main equations is tensorial does not depend on the particular coordinate system that you choose. All right. Uh, so a few words about the initial value formulation. This was something that uh, took a long time for people to understand. Uh, in fact, the Einstein equations uh, originally did not even seem to have hyperbolic character, we say. Uh, it, took, it took some time for people to understand it. Uh, and in fact, it's to a large extent a product of the French school of uh, mathematical physics. Yvonne Choquebrua in particular is the one who really, um, so Yvonne Choquebrua here, is the one who really formulated uh, the first result of this type. So the result says the following thing. First of all, you can talk about initial data sets in general relativity. So what are they? It's very simple. I mean, think of uh, the fact that you already have a space time and you take a hypersurface, which is sigma zero. So let's say we're in C plus one dimensions, which is uh, the standard, uh, physical theory uh, and uh, the space time is is here and you take a hypersurface sigma zero uh, which is such that if you look at the light on at every point on the hypersurface the normal to the hypersurface is uh, time like which means uh, it points in the interior of the light con so this is called the space like hypersurface if this happens at every point uh, so if you take a space-like hypersurface, it's very easy to see that the induced metric, so the space-time metric induces a Riemannian metric here, which is uh, G0. Riemannian, again, just simply means that uh, it's positive definite, so it has signature 1, 1, 1. And uh, this will be the time derivative of the metric, uh, which is a symmetric two tensor. Never mind exactly what it is. The important thing is that it's something, this corresponds to position in some sense, and this corresponds to velocity. And uh, these are the data that you give, plus some kind of constraint equations. So this is very much like in Maxwell theory, when you, you give initial data, you also have to give some constraints. Of course, the constraints in general relativity are more complicated, they're nonlinear, and so on and so forth. Anyway, the, the theorem of Yvonne uh, Bruha, and then compl complemented by some result uh, with Garrosh, is that smooth initial data sets, so these are the initial data sets plus constraints, uh, admit unique smooth maximal future global hyperbolic development, never mind exactly the word. The important thing is that, that uh, there is always a space time that you can construct, at least locally, and uh, this uh, maximal future development represents sort of the maximal extension of the space time as far as you can go. Uh, so this, this is a remarkable result in the sense that it, it associates to any initial data set, it associates a space time, and in a sense, uh, the problem, and it's, it's maximal, so it's, it's a maximal possible development of it. And in a sense, general relativity becomes just a study of maximal future hyperbolic development in, in, in terms of understanding their character, right? So you want to understand the global character of, of such things. Do they end in singularity? Can anything else happen? Uh, can they be extended maximal global hyperbolic development extended for all time in the sense of completeness? In other words, completeness means that if you, uh, if an observer moves in such a space time, uh, does uh, does it stop? Does it time stop at some point because some horrible things happens, falls into a black hole, singularity, or you can go for all time. So all these things are are really the issue of of general relativity. Classical general relativity studies, you can say, studies this uh, maximum future hyperbolic development, right? So this is, uh, this is a remarkable result, uh, proved essentially in the 1950s, based on a lot of uh, developments in, in, in partial differential equations uh, that uh, were done in the first half of the, of the last century. All right, so let me go on, unless there are some questions. So if there are no questions, uh, let, me, let me go on and, and try to talk a little bit about mathematical general relativity. Well, this is what I do. Uh, I'm a mathematician interested in general relativity, so I like to explain what this means. So what does it mean uh, to do study mathematical general relativity? First of all, the basic question is to elucidate the structure of classical general relativity. What is the mathematical structure of general relativity? Second type of questions uh, is to formulate and address the central problems of general relativity. 
and we'll discuss some in, uh, in what happens. And uh, uh, I should say that uh, when we choose problems, and this makes us different from physicists, uh, we are interested, of course, in physically relevant problems, but they also have to satisfy our mathematical sensibilities like beauty, rigor, and mathematical challenges. In other words, you want problems where you really have to develop new mathematics. It's not just the physics of importance, which of course it is, but you also, uh, you also want to uh, attack, tackle problems that really are exciting from a mathematical point of view. They bring something new as far as mathematics is concerned. So in that sense, we are very different. This is, is quite different from what the way physicists to look at, uh, at uh, general relativity. And finally, another thing which is typical mathematics, I would say, is to establish connections to other problems in other fields for other equations, so in partial differential equations or in geometry. Uh, and I, I would like to uh, say that this is some kind of mathematical entanglement that, and Wigner expressed, it, expressed this very, very well in this uh, formulation, mathematical concepts introduced for solving specific. So it's an observation that he made, which he thought was very mysterious, and mathematical concepts introduced for solving specific problems have unexpected mysterious consequences in seemingly unrelated areas. And this is a, a beautiful thing about mathematics, uh, uh, which uh, I would say is part of what I call mathematical GR. Okay, any questions about it? All right, so let me go on. So, uh, okay, so I, I want to talk about black holes, as we said. So uh, I have to say at least a few words about what black holes are. Uh, so first of all, uh, there are explicit solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations, right? So remember Ricci of G, so the Ricci part of the Riemann curvature that's of G has to be identically equal to zero. This is the Einstein vacuum equation. Uh, so there are examples uh, of this solution. The simplest one, of course, is the Minkowski space itself, which was Minkowski 1907. Uh, so this corresponds to uh, the, this family Right, so uh, the care family is a family involving two parameters of explicit solutions. So this is what I said. Uh, Minkowski corresponds exactly with the case A equal M is equal to zero. So it's a trivial solution of uh, reach equal to zero. Schwarzschild is the one uh, discovered immediately after the general relativity was formulated in 1915. Uh, so this corresponds to A equals zero, uh, M different from zero. Uh, and the, the full care family for all uh, powers of A. Uh, the Minkowski space, so here is an expression of Minkowski space in usual variables, in the variables T, X, Y, and Z. So you see the metric, as I said earlier, is minus dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. The light comes from a point, is like this, and so on and so forth. So this is in, in physical variables. Uh, and here you see a picture which uh, is very common for people in general relativity. Uh, it's sort of a, it's a Penrose diagram where, where you do a, a conformal compactification. You see this space time of course is infinite and in, in order to have a picture which uh, is finite, uh, we compactify. This is of course done very often in geometry also. You compactify uh, the, the entire Minkowski space by a conformal transformation. In other words, you keep the angles. So for example, the, the angles at 45 degrees, which correspond to uh, null, to propagation of light, uh, remain at 45 degrees in this picture. Right? So that's uh, uh, this uh, boundary here, it's a boundary at infinity. So th this is a, a boundary infinity in the sense that any null ray in Minkowski space, so this is a, a line at 45 degrees, any null ray uh, ends at the point on uh, on this uh, uh, I plus, which is a, it's called scry. It's called, uh, this is called future null infinity because you are going to the future, past null infinity if you go this way, okay? So this, this is how uh, the Minkowski space looks like in a Penrose diagram. It's interesting, it's, it's, it, by the way, th this corresponds to R equal to zero. So R in polar coordinates, so you, you pass to polar coordinates. So this is R equal to zero. And of course you have to think about the fact that actually the picture rotates around R equal to zero. All right, so that's, uh, so as well as this is not really a boundary. R equal zero is not a boundary. It's just a, 
an artifact of the picture. Okay, so uh, uh, let's look at the care family now in coordinates. Again, I, I just want to give you a sense uh, of the fact that these care solutions are extraordinarily explicit. They correspond to something uh, which are very, very interesting from a physical and mathematical point of view. And yet they, they, they have based formulations. So uh, relative to coordinate systems, so you can write down a system of coordinates, T, R, theta, and phi. So these are like polar coordinates. Uh, the Minkowski metric in polar coordinates will have just minus dt squared. And then there will be plus dr squared. And then uh, a term which will involve d phi and d theta, which corresponds to, uh, to just polar coordinates. In anyway, so the, the coefficients in that case are very simple. But here, the coefficients, of course, uh, are, are more complicated. And uh, they're expressed in terms of, of uh, a and m, which are the parameters here. And the coordinates are theta and, and phi, as you see here. Right? So anyway, uh, checking that it's a solution of the Einstein equation is, of course, what Kerr did. So Kerr discovered this in 1963. It's one of the great discovery, uh, discoveries of the last century, both in mathematics and physics. Uh, it's really a remarkable family. You can read a lot of things from it, like, for example, the fact that they are stationary. Stationary simply means the coefficients of the metric that you see here do not depend on t. On the t. They also don't depend on the variable phi, right? Which, which means that they are not only stationary, but also axisymmetric. Another way of saying it, which is uh, typical to mathematics, is to say that the vector fields t, which is d over dt, and z, which is d over d phi, are killing vector fields, okay? For those who don't know, it doesn't matter, but they are killing vector fields. They correspond to symmetries of the of the care space now. They are also asymptotically flat in the sense that if you let R goes to infinity, then you can immediately see that all these coefficients uh, trivialize to the coefficients of Minkowski space. So in other words, this become minus one, the whole thing here, and you'll get minus dt squared plus dr squared plus so on and so forth, which is a line element, the metric of uh, Minkowski space, all right? So this is, uh, uh, now the Schwarzschild black hole. So in, in the case of Schwarzschild, things simplify because you just take A to be zero, that's all. You just take A to be zero, you get a simplification. The metric now looks like this, where you have uh, delta over R square is one minus two M over R. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a little bit misleading picture of what's going on, but it, it tells you something. It, it, it gives you a feeling of what is a black hole. Because uh, at r equal to 2m, if you, if you look for r larger than 2m, the space time becomes asymptotic. So it becomes more and more Minkowskian. So in particular, the light cones will look like this, right? So a light cone to the future looks like this. Exactly on the event horizon, this light cone looks like this. And if you are inside, it gets tilted and uh, it looks like this, if you are inside R less than 2 m. So what that means, since light propagates inside the light cones, it means that, that the light starting from any point, any event from uh, this region will never get outside, can never cross the event horizon. So this is called the event horizon. Event horizon is some kind of, it's a boundary which separates the black hole from the exterior region. This picture is not very good. It's much better to, to make a Penrose type diagram, which, is, which means a conformal, a conformal uh, diagram, in which case uh, this gives you the maximally extended uh, conformal picture of Schwarzschild, right? So let, let's look a little bit uh, what, it, what it says. So you, you have the black hole region where R is less than 2M, you have the exterior are larger than 2M. And you see the exterior looks more and more like Minkowski space. Uh, this, is, this is a null, future null infinity. So it, remember I said that uh, null rays end up here. So the, the, the future null infinity is actually corresponds to the endpoints of, uh, of, uh, of this kind of null geodesics. The external region is again expressed here. You see on the event horizon, you see that the light cone becomes tangent to the, 
to the uh, horizon. Uh, you see two regions, two external regions, this one and this one. This is an artifact. Uh, it's not a physical fact. Uh, it's an artifact of the explicit solution that it has two ends. It's topologically non-trivial. Uh, it has two ends, of course. Of interest is just this region, the external region and the black hole region. So the black hole region is of course, where you cannot escape uh, and you have uh, R equal to zero, which is a singularity. You can show that uh, the curvature at R equal to zero becomes infinite in uh, all possible senses. So this is a real singularity. And of course, singularities are terrible from the point of view of physics. Uh, you want to avoid them. And so people, uh, they are, We'll talk a little bit about this, right? What is the nature of singularity? What does they mean? Uh, so this is uh, Schwarzschild manifold. It's important, when I say Schwarzschild manifold, it's important that to say that you don't have just one system of coordinates. You cannot view the entire manifold just using these coordinates, which I, I wrote here. In fact, these coordinates even become singular at R equal to 2M, which is exactly on the horizon. So in, you, you have to change coordinates and, and uh, different region are expressed relative to different coordinates. So for example, in order to pass in this region, I have to use a different system of coordinates, which is well understood now, but people had a lot of problems at the beginning of the theory, even Einstein himself, many people had lots of problems with, uh, with this singularity at R equal to 2M, which is not a singularity, it's just the, it's just the horizon. But this, uh, th this was difficult at the beginning of the theory for people. Now it's considered a triviality. Uh, the Kerr space-time looks slightly different, but not much. I'm not, I'm not even looking at this part. I'm looking, th this is the most important part, as I said earlier. Uh, that's a black hole region. That's again the, the exterior region. Uh, the horizon is given simply by the roots, the, the larger root uh, of this polynomial, R squared plus A squared minus 2M over R. You have two roots, you have R equal R plus and R equal R minus. This is called the Cauchy horizon. And maybe I'll say a few words about it later on. It's, it's, it's something annoying. It's not a singularity in the real sense. The curvature does not become infinite here, uh, but something terrible happens nevertheless, which is that past this R equal R minus, I can make infinitely many extensions of my space time, which means that causality breaks down. So this is awful, of course, again, from physical point of view. Causality is an important part of, uh, of uh, physics. Uh, so this has to be seriously discussed. It's almost as bad as a singularity. As singularity. So if for Schwarzschild, we had that singularity at R equals zero. Like here, R minus is larger than zero. So you don't, you don't have that kind of singularity at all. In fact, these things are null. So these are uh, they're, uh, null hypersurfaces. And again, uh, you can extend the space time in infinity many ways, which is awful. So you, you, you really, this is one thing that one needs to understand. So again, external region, event horizon, which is exactly at R equal R plus, uh, black hole region, which is this one, which ends up in this Cauchy horizon, which I wrote here, and null infinity, which corresponds to R equal infinity, right? Which are part, the future and the past null infinities. Okay, so let's go now to the real issue is are black holes real? So, uh, well, black holes, since you, we cannot really see them inside because nothing escapes. How can we even talk about the reality of a black hole, right? So uh, let's analyze it a little bit. So is an object physically real if, even if we don't have in principle direct access to any form of detection? Mathematically, of course, they are perfectly real. Mathematical reality is defined by the set consistency of its objects. Uh, there is a, such a thing of mass, as mathematical reality. So, uh, okay, so that everything is fine from that point of view. We know that uh, black holes are mathematically real, but are they physically real? In other words, well, for that, you have to have some definition of physical reality. The one that I learned as a kid in Romania, uh, based on dialectic materialism, was this one, which is, which is my opinion, an awful definition, all encompassing, including our minds. Uh, uh, sorry, our, our word is missing here, are perceptible through our senses, but completely independent of them. So everything that is perceptible by our senses, but it's completely independent uh, of them, so it's transcendental. 
there is no, uh, we don't affect this reality, but that reality affects us. Uh, and of course, uh, it doesn't, uh, it just doesn't fit with this sort of object. It doesn't fit with quantum mechanics also. Uh, it doesn't fit with the uncertainty principle and so on and so forth. So here is a sort of a better definition, a contingent definition of reality or physical reality. An object is real if it is mathematically self-consistent, plus it leads to observable measurable effects consistent with all other facts of an acceptable theory. So here, here sort of a, is a question. So this reminds uh, me of the Plato's cave. Somehow there is mathematical reality uh, and uh, physical reality has to have all sorts of other things. It's not just mathematically self-consistent. Okay, so, uh, so this is uh, again, uh, the, the, the kind of reality that uh, we want to talk about is uh, in this sense. Uh, okay, so there are indirect tests. So uh, this makes sense, right? We, we, we can talk about something real only even if it's not directly observable because it leads somehow to observable effects uh, indirectly. So uh, uh, there are indirect tests of black holes and there are many Nobel prizes which are obtained on that. So there are astrophysical observations in particular, the, the recent Nobel prize of cancer and gas. Uh, gravitational wave detectors by Barish, Son, and, and Weiss. So this was a few years ago. Numerical simulations, unfortunately, there is no Nobel Prize for numerical simulations, though maybe there should be. Uh, and there are mathematical theorems proved by Penrose for which he also got the Nobel Prize, right? So, uh, so you can see already here, uh, the theme that I'm going to develop uh, later, which is, uh, can you test uh, physical theory using mathematical theorems? Uh, so uh, I just want to, how much time do I have, by the way? I'm a little bit worried with time. Uh, can you finish in, if you can finish in five minutes, we'll have plenty of time for questions. If you need uh, 10, I suppose we can go 10. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll try. Uh, so maybe I, I will stop. Uh, I just mentioned this, the fact that uh, Penrose got the Nobel Prize essentially for proving this theorem, which is, which is a beautiful theorem uh, as, as theorems are today. This is very simple, but uh, very penetrating. Uh, and it had something to do with the notion of uh, trapped surface. Uh, so uh, space time cannot be, so space time has some kind of singularity. This is a way of saying uh, what I'm saying here, if certain conditions are verified. So this condition, for example, when reach is equal to zero is automatically verified. M contains a non-compact hypersurface. So there is some kind of hypersurface which is infinite. And M contains a closed trap surface. So here is a, a trap surface, relative a trap surface, the definition of a trap surface according to uh, Penrose. This was one of the great definition of Penrose. Uh, in fact, the theorem is more or less a definition. So once you understand the definition, uh, the theorem is not very hard to prove. Uh, so the definition. So you see, you you compare the the way a surface looks in Minkowski space, where it generates light cones in the incoming direction and light cones in the outgoing direction. You see, the the volume is decreasing in the incoming direction and increasing in in this direction, while in a trap situation, both directions. The volume in both directions is decreasing, so this is this can be expressed purely in terms of uh, invariants that uh, are defined on the surface itself. They are called null expansions, uh, and both have to be negative. So the, the the null expansion in this direction is is negative. The other one is positive in Minkowski space, uh, and uh, for a trapped surface, both have to be negative. So this is a very very obviously uh, something which is very far away from uh, Minkowski space. It requires large curvatures and so on and so forth. Uh, the remarkable thing that, uh, that uh, Penrose did is to show using this theorem to show the Schwarzschild singularities are stable. So this is actually very simple. Maybe I can explain it in two lines. The important thing is that if you are in a black hole, every point here is in fact a sphere. And you can easily see that every such point is a trapped sphere. So the question was, is it, does the singularity uh, of Schwarzschild, does it stay if you make a perturbation on Schwarzschild? Uh, and more, many people saw that this is just an, an artifact of the special symmetry of Schwarzschild. So uh, if you perturb, it is not going to happen. Well, 
uh, Penrose theorem tells you that that's not the case, that uh, uh, this trap surface is, of course, uh, through that definition, they are clearly, uh, they clearly survive under perturbations, and therefore the singularity will survive under perturbation. Of course, the, the, the Penrose theorem is not very precise. It doesn't quite tell you what kind of singularities you get, but it already it tells you that something terrible happens. Okay. Cosme, another thing that he did for which he got the Nobel Prize, uh, you, I believe he deserved the Nobel Prize for this. I'm not sure that he got it for this, but in any case, it, this is a conjecture that he made, which is a cosmic censorship conjecture, uh, which is uh, again connected with the situation that, that uh, we see in Schwarzschild. You see in Schwarzschild, if you are in the, inside the black hole, you will encounter singularity uh, if you go forward in time. Uh, while if you are outside, you are free of singularities. The conjecture is, is generalizes this to the to general initial conditions, and uh, it says that that somehow uh, you can never have a singularity without having a, a, a black hole. So, in other words, there are no naked singularity. There are no naked singularity in the exterior of a black hole. All singularities have to be inside the black holes. Uh, so there are also other mathematical results, but I won't have time to talk about it, uh, that tell you how you can actually form a trap surface. You see, Penrose tells you that if you have a trap surface, you necessarily have a singularity. These type of results tell you that, uh, that uh, trap surfaces can form from regular initial conditions where you don't have trap surfaces to start with. All right, anyway, I mean, this, this is just to give a sense of the kind of things that people do. Uh, here are some mathematical, the, the broader uh, tests of reality that uh, I call mathematical tests of reality, which are the, the issue of collapse. Can black holes form starting from reasonable initial configuration? This I just talked about. Rigidity. So the rigidity is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, we know that the care solutions are stationary. In other words, they are in some sense time independent. Uh, of course, this, this requires a definition because time is not an absolute, an absolute notion in, uh, in general relativity. Uh, so uh, anyway, but it, it can be defined what stationarity means. And then the question is, are there any other besides the Kerr family? Are there any other stationary solutions? There are some results of Carter, Robinson and Hawking in the 70s. Uh, which require anal analyticity uh, and uh, which is very restrictive, unfortunately. Uh, and there are some other results by Alexakis, myself, and Ionescu, uh, where we actually show that uh, if you are sufficiently close to care in the smooth category, which is much more realistic, uh, the, the, the smooth situation is much more complicated than this situation. If you are in the smooth category, then uh, it's still true. Uh, that if you are close to care, you then you have to be care. In other words, there are no other solutions close to care which are stationary. And then there comes a major issue of stability. So this is maybe the most important thing that the mathematicians are working on now. It's a question, is a care family stable under general asymptotically flat arbitrary small perturbations? So this is, a, I mean, uh, this will take me another full hour to describe, uh, particular. There's been an immense amount of activity in recent years in the mathematical community. Of course, using some of the things that, that people have done, physicists or mathematical physicists have done earlier. But in the last 20 years, the, really, this was a, the, a big problem for mathematicians. And I'm glad to say, uh, to announce that uh, uh, Seftel and I uh, have just been able to prove the general stability of the Kerr family, if A sufficiently small. In other words, uh, you can go for A uh, close to M. So the, the general conjecture would be to do it for A over M strictly less than one. Uh, we can do it for uh, the case when this is sufficiently small. It's also uh, very conceivable that in the near future, we will be able to do the whole thing, but this remains to be done. So this is, this is just something that, uh, uh, the paper will appear recently within the next few days. Uh, it's a, unfortunately, it's a huge paper. So, I mean, the problem is that this kind of results are extremely difficult and they require a lot of, uh, a lot of work. Uh, so our result is, uh, is, uh, is not even complete yet. I mean, we have a, 
we have the paper which will appear, I should say, is just one part of three papers. And that paper is a main paper, uh, has about uh, close to 800 pages. So it's, it's very unfortunate that, uh, that results like this are, uh, take a long time to prove. But the hope is, of course, that, the, that with time, things do simplify. So for example, stability of Nikovsky space, I simplify to, uh, I mean, there are other results in other words that have, have originally been very long, but have been simplified. Uh, I wanted to talk about final state conjecture, uh, which is a conjecture that puts together many uh, steps, in particular stability of Minkowski, which I, I just mentioned, uh, problem of collapse, problem of rigidity, uh, stability, cosmic censorship conjecture, uh, the two and many more body problem. This is uh, connected with interaction of black holes, but I won't have the time. I, I should just simply say that uh, this is, uh, uh, mathematical general relativity is really a remarkable part of mathematics today, uh, where there is a immense amount of activity. There are uh, lots of very, very interesting problems. In particular, if you look, for example, at this uh, final state conjecture, you see how many, how many, uh, extremely difficult uh, problems uh, appear. Uh, people simplify things, you, you assume certain symmetries and then you simplify things become a little bit easier. But nevertheless, uh, uh, the big problems are the ones uh, which I mentioned. There is also, uh, and I'll finish with this one, uh, there are also issues that have to do with the singularities in GR. I mean, in, in a sense, the, the, this final state conjecture relates uh, the mathematics uh, of what happens outside black holes, right? So you go all the way to black holes. Uh, this has to do with what happens inside black, ho black holes. Uh, it, it's connected with the fact that uh, this horizon, the, this question, are these Cauchy horizons real? Of course, they are mathematically real. Are they physically real? In other words, are they stable on their transformations? And, uh, and uh, there is a conjecture, which is a, a conjecture by Penrose also, that, uh, that uh, should tell you that th this does not survive. If you perturb uh, the care solution a little bit, this is not going to happen. Uh, Penrose thought that you get a singularity just like in Schwarzschild, but things are more complicated. There are results of the fairness and blue, but I won't have time to talk about it. So I'll stop here. Okay, great. Uh Thanks, uh, Sergio. This is a very uh, enlightening uh, talk. Uh, ev the, everyone, uh, we're open for uh, questions, which you can put in the chat or the uh, Q&A. And uh, while you post your questions, let me uh, ask uh, Sergio the first. So you said that uh, singularities are, are bad for physics, but from the point of view of string theory or any extension of general relativity, in a sense, singularities are good for physics because you need to go beyond the general relativity test to test your new theory. And so one would like to know whether cosmic censorship is truly valid so that we do not have access to singularities or if there are exceptions and possible observable consequences of, of singularities. So has the conjecture been uh, settled and what, what's your opinion about it, the conjecture? No. Okay, so there are two, first of all, two, uh, unfortunately I had to go too fast. There are two cosmic censorship conjecture. One, which is uh, the, this uh, weak uh, cosmic censorship, so-called so weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which has something to do about the external of black holes, which says that outside black holes, you don't have singularities. Uh, so, and then there is this other one, which I mentioned here, which is inside black holes. Inside black holes, you should have singularities. So you are not going to avoid singularities, no matter what. Uh, it's just a matter of the nature of singularities. The, 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 in a, well, actually here, there is also this issue of Cauchy horizon, which is the issue of causality. Uh, so uh, in any case, you, there are specific proposal of what should happen with the singularities inside. Of course, we are very, very far from uh, any of these two conjectures, in fact. Uh, but there's so, no evidence uh, against out, the uh, so, weak one or, weak one or... so th there will be the issue of naked singularity outside the horizon uh -huh. and, and inside of course you'll have singularities the question is uh, what exactly is the nature of singularity but you're absolutely right i mean quantum mechanics would like to would, i mean people would like to introduce quantum mechanics uh, with general relativity uh, string theory it's such a proposal 
but uh, uh, this, uh, of course, is still a dream, right? So we don't we don't know what happens. Okay. Uh, well, I'll continue with a question from a Tournier. Do you think your methodology could be used in the arena of quantum physics? Yeah, I mean, the, look, I mean, the, the, this is exactly what I meant uh, when I talked about this uh, entanglement, right? That mathematics, which is developed for certain problems, turn out to be relevant in others. I mean, this has happened all the time through history, right? Uh, uh, the kind of physics, very often physics that was used by physicists at a given time was developed uh, for a completely different problem by mathematicians 100 years earlier or maybe 50 years earlier or something like that. That has happened many, many times. And uh, so the hope is that uh, though we don't really work on, 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 uh, on quantizing uh, general relativity, uh, we hope that some of the things which are developed here will be useful for other things. I don't know where, of course, but, uh, but uh, I mean, in, in other words, again, I, I think this is very important and may, maybe many times people don't realize that this, this is a, the major difference between mathematics and physics, right? That in, in, in mathematics, you really, uh, you work on a specific problem, you, you try to solve it, you push the, the boundary of what's known mathematically, and as a consequence, you, you bring new tools, which may be, uh, which very often are useful in other things. And concepts, not just tools, but you, you bring concepts very often. Right, thanks. Uh, an anonymous question. Uh, do black holes move in space and change position? And if yes, what is the cause? And can they change form? <laughs> That's a good question, yeah. Uh, so th th this is an issue of uh, dynamical black hole. Uh, obviously, I was talking about stationary. The stationary the, the black holes are really the end, the final, uh, they are sort of the asymptotics of more general black holes, which are still dynamical, which are changing, things are, uh, there is radiation that moves inside and the, 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 the black hole itself is changing. And of course you can have interactions of black holes. You, the two black holes, again, dynamical black holes, they, they can uh, coalesce even, right? They, if they are very close to each other, they can coalesce. Of course, we have Thibaut Damour, I understand, uh, who is one of the experts in this. Uh, so th there are very, I mean, th there's a lot of dynamics with black holes. I mean, so th the kind of black holes that I was talking about, the these care solutions are the final states of dynamics. In, in fact, this, uh, this uh, uh, cosmic, sorry, this final state conjecture, states exactly this, right? They, I, I, didn't, I didn't spend time on this, but uh, initial data sets behave in the large, like a finer number of care black holes moving away from each other. In, in other words, asymptotic. If you start with initial conditions, you can have some very complicated dynamics, and, but asymptotically, as time goes to infinity, you are going to see just a finer number of care black holes moving away from each other. Uh, the reason for this would be that that black holes, uh, again, will have, in, will have complicated dynamics. Uh, they, they can coalesce and they form only one black holes or they can move far away from each other. And therefore, asymptotically, if this conjecture is true, uh, then you are only going to see uh, black holes moving away from each other and, and some radiative decaying term, in other words, some kind of radiation moving away to infinity. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, one last uh, question from uh, John Thrilla, who, uh, in fact, uh, this, this question is prompted by an article today in the uh, New York Times by uh, Dennis Overby, who asked the question, what should one call a bunch of black holes? And of course, the uh, analogy would be to uh, groups of animals for which there are all sorts of uh, whimsical terms in the English language. Of course, there's a uh, pack of uh, lions or a pride of lions or a pods of whales. And given that we observe now these collections of black holes in space, perhaps we need a collective noun for the uh, black holes and the uh, suggestions that were, there's, a, there's even a uh, poll giving su suggestions such as a crush of black holes or a enigma yeah. of black holes. And I wonder, Johnny asks, have, have, have you uh, thought about this question or what would come to your mind for a collective of black holes? 
collection of black holes. But again, you know, the, this final state conjecture really gives you a story, right? It gives you the fact that in, in reality, in any uh, finite regional space, you'll see only one eventually. So they they they, they, they tend to spread apart, and so uh, the collective all coalesce and form only one, right? So okay, uh, okay. So what would be the right term? So we'll, we, we'll, we'll think about that. And uh, you know, if you have any <laughs> suggestions, uh, the uh, poll is uh, going on uh, now, I understand, from the New York Times article. And uh, so uh, with that uh, note, let's uh, thank uh, Sergio again for a really uh, excellent talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, clap and uh, represent uh, all of us in applauding this uh, talk. Uh, let me uh, now uh, announce that uh, the Friends of IHES will be holding its uh, biannual uh, gala this year on uh, November 16, and uh, it, this year will be in a, a hybrid format. So, of course, in part because of the uh, pandemic, but in part to uh, give uh, more of us the uh, opportunity to uh, entertain, you know, to attend this uh, you know, very uh, illuminating and uh, entertaining event. So uh, the topic uh, this year will be women in fundamental research. So we have uh, honorees and uh, we have uh, quite a, a spectacular program planned. So uh, mark your calendars, uh, November 16. And uh, I remind you all that uh, the IHES relies on the support of all of us, uh, public support, private donors. There's a website, uh, friendsofiehs.org, uh, and uh, I encourage you all to uh, give what you can. And uh, I thank you all for attending our virtual event, and I look forward to seeing everyone again soon. So long. Bye-bye. Thanks.